science is now proving free will. But, you know, I mean, as Christians, we've believed in free will for uh, 2,000 years. Uh, going back to the early church, you know, they were always debating with uh, the Gnostics, who believed uh, that we were just necessitated by our nature to sin. And the early church says, no, you know, we have free will, we're responsible for our actions. And then you had this philosophy that uh, the stars uh, determined your fate, and it was uh, fatalism. And again, the early church, you know, they said, no, we have, uh, we have free will. And it even goes beyond the, the early church, obviously, to, uh, you know, the Old Testament with uh, Joshua, who says, you know, uh, choose you this day whom you will serve. And, you know, God said, I'll set before you life and death, therefore choose life. And so free will is not a new concept, it's not a new idea, but it is interesting that uh, science is finally catching up to the Bible. They're catching up with the Bible. Uh, I read a book on uh, neuroscience, it was actually uh, recommended by my friend uh, Winky Prattney uh, by Dr. Caroline Leaf uh, called Switch on Your Brain. and uh, It's about uh, neuroscience and uh, genetics and that sort of thing. Um, it was in contrast to like the old school thought. I guess in the past 10 years there's been a uh, big development in uh, neuroscience. The old school thought was that the brain that you have is just like hardwired and once your you know adult brain has been formed, I mean that's your brain for the rest of your life and you just, you know, are a uh, a victim really of whatever brain you inherit and uh, whatever brain is formed, uh, that's it. Uh, but now they're what's called uh, neuroplasticity. They realize that your your brain is actually moldable and shapeable. Uh, you can look at a person's brain, like Einstein's brain, and you can tell that he was a violinist because certain uh, wrinkles in his brain uh, formed that I guess always form in someone who is you know a real serious violinist. I guess the same thing can go for uh, like the piano or any other music. Uh, you can just look at the wrinkles in their brain and can tell what type of thought patterns they had, what kind of exercises of the brain uh, that they chose to develop. And so the old school thought, you know, if you look at like a serial killer, you know, the part of the brain for sympathy and empathy, uh, compassion, you know, that part of the brain would be really, really tiny, really, really small, and they would say, oh, look, this poor serial killer, it's not his fault. Uh, this is just his brain. You know, he couldn't be sympathetic because look how small that part of his brain is. It's underdeveloped. Uh, so it's really, a, it's it's not a sin. It's not a crime. It's, it's really like a, a mental illness is all it is. Uh, that's the old school thought, but really, uh, your brain is like a muscle, and you choose to exercise it. So with uh, neuroplasticity, it teaches that you wire and rewire your brain. So if you choose to be a sympathetic person, that part of the brain will develop even more. You know, if you choose to uh, be a, a, a selfish uh, person and you choose not to have sympathy for other people, uh, then you are choosing to leave that part of the brain undeveloped. It's just like any other muscle of the body. You know, if you're doing push-ups and pull-ups and uh, sit-ups, uh, you're going to develop your, your arms and your stomach and all of that. Uh, but if you choose not to do those exercises, then they're going to remain undeveloped. But the potential is there. It's just a matter of your choice. And so you are not a victim of the brain that you just inherit or the adult brain that forms. Uh, you actually form and mold your own brain. And you're doing it every day. Every day you're creating thought patterns and habits uh, throughout your life. And so, uh, you know, people that have like... Uh, uh, learning disabilities, you know, I was, they said I had a learning disability when I was growing up. I never believed it. I thought I had a lack of motivation. I just, I didn't care to learn uh, their, what they were teaching me. I didn't see a reason. I didn't see the end goal. You know, I didn't have a motivation for it. But they diagnosed me as having a learning disability uh, with language. They said, oh, you can't learn other languages. They tried to teach me Spanish, and I just, uh, I, I gave up. I didn't care. It seemed like a bunch of babble. I didn't know anyone that spoke Spanish, you know, and I had no 
intention of going to a Spanish speaking country. I was just a kid in middle school and so I just didn't care and so then they told me oh you have a learning disability you can't learn another language which is bogus because you know I learned English just fine. Uh, I learned English without even trying you know uh, as a child and so I can learn language in fact now I do my daily devotions in Greek you know because I had a motivation to learn Greek. I had a reason to learn it, you know. I want. I come from a Greek family, and my my family's been reading, the, you know, the Greek New Testament going back generations. In fact, uh, you know, even here I have. Um, this was something my uh, my great uncle gave me. Uh, this was the Greek New Testament of my grandfather's aunt, which is really cool. And so, you know. They said I had a learning disability, but it's really it's how you practice your brain, how you use your brain. If you, you know, learning something, when I first read Finney's Systematic Theology, that was difficult because he used language I wasn't familiar with, vocabulary and concepts I wasn't familiar with. So the first time, let's see, I have it here. Uh, <laughs> here's, the, here's the big one I made. Uh, Finney's Theology. I read this like 10 years ago. First time I read this, um, it was difficult, very, very difficult. But I managed to go through it. I underlined and highlighted and really worked my way through it. I loved it. I mean, this was a great, great book. Um, but the second time I read it, I read the smaller version. Let's see. I have it right here. That was, this bigger one here, this is the 1951 edition, um, which is more uh, thorough. But then there was the 1878 edition. When I read this one, uh, it was a breeze because, you know, I was already familiar with all the concepts. I was already familiar with the vocabulary. And so you develop your own brain and you're, you're making connections, uh, neurological connections uh, in, your, in your mind. So you're constantly, every day, wiring and rewiring your brain. You're creating your own thought patterns. And so neuroplasticity uh, really shows free will, uh, that you are not just a victim of your brain, but your brain is the product of your own choices. Your brain is the product of your own thoughts. And then the, the book uh, also talked about epigenetics, which was cool. Because, you know, the old school thought was that you have just a genetic determinism, you know, that you act a certain way and do certain things because of the genetics that you just inherit uh, from your ancestors and from your, from your parents. Uh, a good example is like a, an alcoholic, you know, and my father uh, and, and his father and his father uh, were all alcoholics. And so people get this fatalistic um, type mentality of, oh, well, I just inherited this disease of alcoholism. Uh, it's really not my fault. It's, it's, it's my ancestors' fault. You know, I just inherit this, and it's just who I am. And when I got clean and sober, you know, 15 uh, or 16 years ago, I said, no, forget that. You know, it's, uh, it's my own choice, my own free will. If other people can live sober, then I can live sober. And I don't care about uh, this whole genetic determinism, this alcoholism is a disease type thing. I'm just going to choose not to do it. And I've been clean and sober for, uh, well, for 16 years now. And so you can have, you know, what ideas have consequences. If you think that you're just a victim of your genetics uh, or a victim of your brain, uh, that's going to affect your, your life choices. It's going to affect your mentality. Uh, but back to this epigenetics. Now, every cell of your body has the same genetic code as every other cell. And so the cells in your heart are the same types of, or the, the genetic code in the cells of your heart is the same genetic code in the cells of your liver. But there's these chemicals that attach to your genetic code that basically turn on or off uh, this uh, for genetic expression. And so the genetic code in your heart is, you know, the parts of the genetic code that says, you know, be a liver, those are all turned off. But the parts of the genetic code that says, you know, be a heart, those are all turned on. And the same goes for the liver. The parts of the, the genetic code for your liver, uh, all of that, uh, all of the genetic uh, code for be a heart is turned off. And so it's these, these 
ep it's called epigenetics because epi uh, is a Greek word for above and so it means above the genetic code that there's more to it than just the mere genetic code there's these chemicals that attach to your uh, genetics and what you choose to think about and the choices that you make can actually turn on or off this genetic uh, these genetic codes and affect the what's called genetic expression and so if you choose to be an alcoholic you're going to be affecting, uh, in an epigenetic way, you're going to be affecting your genetic expression, and you might pass on to your uh, children this disposition towards alcohol, uh, which means if they choose to embrace alcohol, uh, then those uh, genetic uh, expressions are going to be turned on. But if they choose not to embrace alcohol, then those genetic uh, expressions will be will be turned off. And so the Bible says to the third and fourth generation. So eventually, you know, uh, if a person, if a if if you choose no alcohol for two to three generations, uh, that genetic uh, you know disposition uh, will probably just disappear, or at least that's the that's what this book was saying. And so. Uh, you know, you're not a victim of your genetics. You can turn on or off uh, these genetic expressions. So if you look at like identical twins, now they're identical in their genetic code, but they're not identical in their thought patterns. They're not identical in their character. They're not identical in their lifestyle because they've had different circumstances. They've, they've had different choices. They've thought different thoughts. And so they've turned on and off uh, different uh, genetic codes and different genetic expressions. So it's it's really free will. You know, it's not this hardline determinism of your genetics and of your brain. It's all hardwired and you have no choice in the matter, but that you are actually choosing uh, which uh, genetic codes are going to be expressed in genetic expression. You're choosing what neurological pathways are going to be formed in your mind. Uh, you're choosing these things uh, yourself. And so it, I think this also goes to show like with say homosexuals okay there's an enormous amount of testimonies of people who used to be homosexuals but now they're not and of course uh, the homosexual community said oh they're just living in denial of uh, who they really are but uh, you know if you if you look at this from a from the scientific standpoint of uh, of neuroplasticity and of epigenetics it means that you can you can change your thought patterns you can change your neurological connections you can rewire your brain and reshape and remold your brain and when it comes to things like sex sex really happens in the brain um, you know with any desire of the body you can it can become perverted just like drugs just like alcohol if you choose to embrace these things your body starts to crave them but you know when I said no to drugs and alcohol and I went through some withdrawals but eventually those desires went away uh, because my brain uh, or my my mind and my body uh, changed because I'm not feeding it this junk and the same thing goes with with sexuality if you're feeding your brain perversion and a lot of uh, you know people are looking at pornography and they're corrupting their mind and and start developing these these unnatural desires that they didn't have before and insatiable lust and so if you're feeding your brain these things you're corrupting your brain you're creating neurological pathways that are being uh, ingrained into your mind but that can be changed if you change your thoughts change your choices you can literally get a new brain and so the bible says you know if any man be in christ he is a new creature the old has passed behold all things have become new so i think that this uh you know breakthrough in neuroscience about neuroplasticity is really complementary to the bible not just on free will but on salvation that you can become a new creature in christ where all things have become new your brain literally your brain becomes new and i i remember you know, before I got saved, and I used to listen to all this rap music, and that gives you thoughts, and what goes into your mind, what you think about affects your choices, and so, you know, they say that, you know, you become like the your friends that you associate with, you know, take the five, you're, you are like the sum of the five of your best friends, uh, if it takes like six months or whatever, whoever you're hanging out with, you know, in six months, you'll be just like them, 
And so before I got saved, and I'm listening to all this rap music, and I'm hanging around with people doing drugs and alcohol, and I became just like them. And especially with the rap music I listen to, that's like, you know, blaming the government for this and that, or, you know, blaming society for the way they are, and, uh, you know, especially Tupac's uh, music. You know, he took no responsibility for his life. He says, I was raised this way, or it's the government's fault, society, I'm the product of society, that type of mentality. So I had this blame mentality as a sinner that, well, I, you know, I come from a broken home, I come from a poor family, uh, oh, they say I have a learning disability, and all this stuff. And so I, I didn't take responsibility for my life, and so I was committing all sorts of crimes and wickedness with a, with a blaming mentality. But when I got saved, you know, and prior to salvation, the work of the Holy Spirit convicting me really impressed upon my mind these two, these two ideas and two concepts which were vital to my salvation is that uh, you are who you choose to be. And so despite your circumstances growing up, despite your childhood, uh, you're an adult now and you are making your own choices. Okay, And you are who you choose to be. And then secondly, uh, life is what you make it. You know, life is handed to you when you're a child, uh, but when you grow up, uh, your life is, is what you make it. And so these two concepts were vital for me to take responsibility for my life, for me to be convicted. And so I've had a different mentality completely when I got saved. One, from, you know, blaming other people and other things for my life to now, you know, taking responsibility and setting a good direction for my own life. And so my, my mindset completely changed. And I started thinking constantly about God. When I got saved, I mean, I just was like, man, I'm going to bed thinking about God. I'm waking up thinking about God. And then all throughout my day, I'm thinking about God. And so my thought patterns changed. My, my thought habits changed. You know, basically your habits are just your thought patterns. Uh, you, you do things out of automation as a result of your thought patterns. So uh, there's a lot of cool things in this book. It was, you know, Dr. Caroline Leaf, she's a Christian. And so she's coming at it from a Christian perspective. A lot of extra bonuses too, you know, like uh, your memory is actually like protein in your brain. And so when someone loses their memory, they're actually like losing protein in their brain. So Alzheimer's or dementia, they're actually losing protein in their brain. And I heard other studies about, um, you know, actually affecting your stomach that you need to... Um, uh, treat your stomach so that you can absorb the proteins and the nutrients that you used to absorb when you were younger and it has an effect on people with dementia and Alzheimer's but but that's a uh, well that's a little different um, but but your memory you know when you first learn something it's in your short-term memory you have to do something for like 21 days for it to go into your long-term memory and so that's really helpful for your study habits. You know, when I'm uh, trying to memorize Greek or something, I want to read it uh, about 21 times, you know, and uh, repeat the word 21 times. Think about it 21 times to create long-term memory. But then you have uh, what's called automation, which takes about 63 days to get to an automated level. So when you look at, like, when I, I took martial arts when I was a teenager, and I knew that it, the, it's re, re, you know, repetition, you know, throwing the same punches, throwing the same kicks, doing the same blocks and all of that so that when you're in a street fight, uh, you don't think about it because you don't have time to think about it. You just do it out of instinct. It get, you get to a level of automation. And same thing with being fluent in any language. You, it just becomes automatic. And it takes 63 uh, days for you to get to an, uh, an automated level. And so was another cool thing was with the brain, when you're visualizing something, you're dreaming about something, your brain doesn't know the difference between that and reality. And so like Navy SEALs are taught to visualize themselves, you know, achieving their goals and all of that stuff. Uh, visualization, I think, can help speed that process up to automation if you're visualizing yourself doing something. But your brain doesn't know the difference. It forms the same neurological pathways as if you were actually doing it when you're just visualizing it. Uh, that's well that's another reason pornography is so detrimental to the brain it literally causes brain damage because it's just as if you are committing adultery when Jesus says if you look upon a woman with lust you're committing adultery with her in your heart as far as your brains concerned as far as the neurological pathways being formed in your brain uh, it's as if you're actually doing it and so there's really no difference but but you know harnessing the power of visualization to visualize yourself uh, doing something you can get to that level of automation uh, much faster.
And uh, so it was a really cool study. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Neuroscience, neuroplasticity, epigenetics. You know, I wrote a book on free will. Uh, I think it's right right here. Uh, the Natural Ability of Man. Many of you, I think, have read it. Uh, people told me all over the world they've read it. I know this book has been to uh, like Egypt and Africa and the Philippines and all over the world. And I wrote a book on free will. This I wrote this when I was like 24. So it was, it was uh, well, I'm 32 now. And so I wrote this a while ago. Uh, but it's cool to study like neuroplasticity to see that science is catching up to the Bible. I wrote this from a theological standpoint that you know you're not a victim of your nature that you would just inherit uh, you make your own choices you form your own character you know that was vital to my own salvation uh, to take responsibility for my life and stop blaming other people and uh, you form your own character and so uh, I just wanted to share some nuggets you know about uh, what I've been studying what I've been reading I hope uh, you know that this will be beneficial and edifying to you you know really think about what type what what kind of thought patterns uh, you're you're creating another cool thing about the book. Okay, I almost forgot this was was memory. Since since your brain or since your memories are actually these proteins in your brain, when when you remember something, you're bringing it back into memory. It's going from your subconscious, which is where it was stored in your memory, to your consciousness. Now you're consciously remembering something. And when you bring it back into consciousness, the effect of neuroplasticity applies that you can reshape it. You can, you can literally change your memories. Uh, in fact, they say anytime you remember something, you are changing it. You're either making that memory stronger by remembering it the same way, or you can look at it from a different perspective. You can have a different view on it, and consequently, literally and physically, physiologically, change your memory. And so I've been trying to do that with, you know, negative thoughts that I have, negative memories that I have, you know, disadvantages I had growing up. I can remember these things, bring them back into consciousness, and then look at them from a more positive perspective. You know, not, not, not lying to myself, not, even, not trying to bend the truth, but just looking at them from a genuinely, um, you know, different perspective and seeing maybe things that I thought were disadvantages, if you look at it in a different light, uh, can be advantages. And so you can change bad memories into good memories. Um, you, can, you can reshape your memories. So, you know, think about throughout your life uh, the, the thought patterns that you're creating. If you're constantly thinking negative thoughts, you know, the Bible says, whatsoever is pure, whatsoever is holy, whatsoever is good, think on these things. Uh, hold on a minute. Yeah, I'm making a video, dear. Um, well, I'm filming right now. So whatever you're thinking about, you know, you could obviously either negative or positive, you know, do what the Bible says. Think about pure things. If you're if you're constantly battling like sexual impure thoughts in your mind, you know, you need to you need to not just deny those thoughts, but you need to replace those thoughts with positive things. If you're uh, just constantly uh, like a pessimist and you're thinking the worst in every uh, situation, you know, and and pessimism leads to stress, and stress really leads to bad health and affects your body on a physiological level. Um, you know, you can you can rewire your thought patterns. You can reshape these neurological connections in your brain and the more you think about something the more ingrained it becomes and so th whatsoever is pure, whatsoever is holy, whatsoever is good, you know, think on these things. Don't fill your mind full of negative toxic thoughts. Uh, and you know that's uh, that's uh, just good advice for today. So, uh, anyways, if you if you've read my book on free will, uh, leave a review in the comments. I want to read uh, so what you think about it. And, uh, you know, comment in the description or comment, you know, in this video about uh, what you thought of, of some of these things. So, uh, anyways, uh, have a good day. Think some good thoughts and, uh, you know, take responsibility for your life. So, God bless you guys.